Hey there, Dave Flatus, Canon Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our YouTube page, and we're down in the silo. Uh, it's a little cool down here, but it's nothing like it is outside, and uh, we are glad you're here with us. We have about just a tad over 190,000 subscribers right now. We've noticed a lot of comments about people being unsubscribed from our channel, which is odd. I don't understand why this is happening or why it does happen. But uh, we've had people that have been monitoring us and have stated that it's, it's extremely unusual the pace, the slow pace that we are getting subscribers compared to the number of comments and the number of people who watch our YouTube regularly. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we've talked about leaving YouTube because there seems to be some function that's keeping us throttled back which I don't like since we're trying to grow. But uh, everyone who watches this, please put this on all your social media. Tell your friends to watch it and tell them this is nothing but facts. We're just giving you a representation of what happened without any theories. Now, the one thing I am going to read to you today is some theories that have been supplied by you, the viewer, that have been submitted to me that you may not have heard about. So I'll throw it by you. So some people think that uh, these people are being taken because whatever needs their soul. Now I'll go back and I've studied, I've studied this a lot as does our team, religious writings. In Krishna writing, going back 5,000 years, one of the, some of the oldest religious writings available, they've stated that we have a soul. And then when we die, our soul moves on to another entity. Now that's an interesting thought because coroners can't determine the cause of death many times in these cases. So is it that the soul has moved on, but the function, the physical function of our body is still in good shape? And that's why they can't determine it. Just a thought. It has a, we have a DNA variant that uh, whatever needs it. So we talk about physicians, we talk about physicists that are real high functioning people and maybe whoever needs that high functioning DNA for a specific reason. This person is going to have a negative or very impactful positive issue on the world and maybe they don't want the world to change. They, maybe they have a preconceived idea of our path and whoever person is taken is going to predominantly change that. So they want to remove them so that doesn't happen. I don't know. Just giving you the thoughts of people. The person is a bad carrier, is a carrier of a bad gene. I've talked about a lot of people who have disabilities who have disappeared. And maybe they want to keep our DNA pure and clean and they have these Every once in a while, a bad gene will make its face known and they have to take it out of society. Thought? The individual that was taken posed an unusual challenge. That's a fascinating thought to me because uh, I've had that stated to me many times after Missing 411 Hunters came out. Uh, armed people know the woods, sportsmen usually in good shape, and they're gone. Well, maybe those people posed an unusual challenge to something, someone. A predator, the predator of us, just happened to be in the area and be bored. Possibly. In the predator's world, we have, our life has no value. So are we that people in an ant farm? And something's looking at us saying, yeah, we can squash them like nothing. They, they really have no meaning to us. Well, there's been shows I've watched in the past, science fiction kind of shows that talk about our society from a third person perspective and they look at us being violent. We don't even respect each other's ability to live and the violent attacks on each other. And they say, hmm, these people are so crude and they're so, their thinking is so obtuse that we would never want to interact with them because of what, what could they add to our world? They're violent against each other. If you think about that, imagine that somebody from another world is watching some peaceful protesters in downtown Washington, D.C. 
seemed brutally attacked by others. What's the point? I don't get it. And if you're one of those people and you're sitting in your basement bedroom looking at me talking, then I have no respect for you. Because if you have no respect for life, then I don't really care what happens to you. And I really don't want you around me and I don't want you around my family or friends. But if we as a society don't respect each other and don't treat each other with kindness, then how would another world ever view us? Think about it. The answer is so far beyond our realm of understanding that it's worthless an attempt to, under even, to understand it. I've heard that many times. You know, we think about an entity having a human form, an animal form. What if the entity is a cloud? What if the entity is something so strange that it would scare us so bad that we couldn't even be in its presence because the physical form is so bad? Maybe. So, another thought is uh, people said that the bodies that we're finding aren't really the people's bodies, but they're clone bodies. My response to that is, why even talk about it? If they're cloned, we're never going to be able to figure it out. So, it's, it's kind of worthless to me. Uh, it may have some value to somebody else, but not to me. And I'm going to just stick to it's the original body and away we go. I had a comment from the last video, Dr. Roberts in Minneapolis, St. Paul, his body was pushed out of a car. I kind of laughed. I mean, come on, folks. Uh, they put a homicide team on that, bot, on that case of Dr. Roberts because they were so concerned. Now, a coroner is just like an, a police investigator, but they deal with the body. So they're looking at minute scratches, dust particles, rubber, you get pushed out of a car, you're going to have bruising, scratches. If you're placed on the roadway from a car, you're going to have sediment from the road on your shirt, on your body. Uh, and the point was nobody saw this. And it, unusually, it was an area in an area that wasn't filmed on that freeway, which was weird. But no, he wasn't pushed. And in fact, everybody associated with it said he came from above, but there was no place to come from above. So how did he get there? I have no idea. And neither does anybody else. But start paying attention to this and try not to come up with answers that appease your mind. Uh, I've given you, and I will give you more, I've given you enough cases to make you start thinking critically about this. People who post comments on these videos, that's great, I like it. But don't just throw up a video with no comment. I'm going to take it down. I'm not going to waste your time and somebody else's. And if you're trying to advertise or get views for somebody else, that's not going to work. I'm just going to take all those down. Like I told you before, I go through these comments. Anybody who's saying anything rude, anything obtuse, anything offensive, it's coming down. You're not going to get on. So try if you want, but it's not going to happen. We're one of these places where I want it to grow. I want it to grow with good content with critical thinking, with people that are smart. Just keep throwing them out there. So, somebody sent me an email this week that uh, shook me up. We've talked about dreams before. Dreams. Um, how do we get them? Where do they come from? And I talked about people who had dreams who later thought that they knew where a body was located. So, where did those dreams come from? How do they know where a body would be? But it's happened too many times to be happenstance or to be luck. Think about this one. After listening to your YouTube video and how you talked about communication with some sort of possible entity through dreams and how one person was found by such means, I wanted to tell you a story of a similar nature concerning dream communication. In January of 95, my younger brother died at the age of six in a tragic accident. Later that year, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. After my dad heard about the children that died that were in the daycare of the Oklahoma City building that was bombed, he said a sort of prayer to my brother, asking him to watch over those kids. 
The next day, <clears throat> the wife, who was married to a man my brother was very close with, parentheses, and they're both close friends to my whole family, end of parentheses, called my dad and was shaken, telling my dad to call her husband because he had a dream about my brother. This man, Jack, told my dad in his dream that he was in a beautiful meadow and my brother was there with him. They started chatting it up like old times. Then all of these small kids appeared around my brother. And Jack asked, what was up with all these kids? And my brother simply said he was watching over them and then the dream ended. Take note. My dad hadn't talked to Jack at all during this time period and certainly didn't or hadn't talked to him about that little prayer he had sent up to my brother. It was only after the fact, just because obviously it completely blew us away to send up a private prayer and have that prayer confirmed by a close family friend who had no idea about what my dad had prayed for. I read that and I thought, my God, how's that happen? I think it's amazing. So, I wanted to I wanted to give you that message. Pay attention to your dreams. I have no doubt that someday one of you out there, and the hundred ninety thousand subscribers, will have one that'll mean something really important to somebody. I've had one about a family member and I told this person about it. We've had conversations about it and it's a private moment, but uh, this person knows. I'm going to talk to you about three cases today, three cases that all have a common denominator and I'm going to pound this point home to you guys. Some of you don't want to acknowledge what I'm telling you because it doesn't fit with your paradigm. And it's always the people who haven't read the books. Once you read the books, it'll absorb into you and you'll understand. But the people who haven't think that they've got this knowledge base, and it's just not going to work. So, but I'm going to keep pounding away on you so, you, so you will listen. First case, April 14th, 1949, Donaldsville, Ohio, 2.30 uh, p.m. Sandy Robeson, three-year-old little girl, lived with a family called the Fosters on their large farm. It was large. They were a wealthy family. And Sandy was a foster child. Her mom had severe mental illness and was in a hospital. And her dad uh, was working full time. Came by and saw Sandy occasionally, but was really de detached from her. The Fosters loved Sandy a lot. A ton. Everybody knew it in the community. They doted over the girl. So, on this day, she was swinging on the swing right outside the front front porch and Mrs. Foster was watching her, came outside after just a couple minutes and she was gone. Searched, couldn't find her. Looked around, called neighbors, immediately called the Clark County Sheriff and a big search starts. The location of this farm is five miles, five miles northeast of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. If you don't know about that, look it up and read the history behind it. So she's swinging on the swing, she disappears, the sheriff arrives, huge search. They call all the deputies they can from the area. They get every neighbor in the area. They get volunteer firefighters from 40 miles away. They get hundreds of people walking shoulder to shoulder through the farm. And on April 18th, they find Sandy on the bank of Jackson Creek in the farm, an area that had been searched. She's laying on her back, but she's deceased and she's very clean. They can't understand why, why she's so clean being missing for four days. That is Sandy. So you can see her cute, cute girl. So they send the body to Springfield for autopsy and they don't find any bruises, scratches, nothing on the body. 
they didn't understand the cause of death for many, many weeks. The investigators said that there were no tracks around the body. They don't know how she got there. And the coroner, after two months, determines that the cause of death was hypothermia. So I always say local reports for local consumption. I'm saying that I don't think they really knew what caused her death, and that's the reason it took so long. And they tried to come up with something to appease the community. So let's think about this. She's found in an area that was previously searched maybe three or four times. She's found right next to water. Point of separation, she left the front of the farm, something happened. Uh, missing time, she's missing four or five days worth of time. Next to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. I have no doubt that Sandy fits this profile. And she was placed there because she didn't walk there. They placed the, the time of death at about 1 p.m. on April 15th, the day after she disappeared, which means she was alive when hundreds of people were in the field through the whole night looking for her, calling her name. There was no sexual abuse to the body. She was completely normal. What happened? Case number one. Case number two, Zygmunt Adamski. So, before I move on, Sandy's body, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Columbus, right near Great Lakes, Lake Erie, Lake Michigan. All right? So you kind of get a feeling for where this happened. By the way, there's Dayton. I've flown through Dayton dozens of times when my son Ben was playing hockey at Miami, Ohio University. Every time I went through Dayton, they had huge displays on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I stopped many times to read them all. Very interesting. Second case, Zygmunt and Damsky in the UK. The UK is an island, folks, surrounded by an ocean. So if you pay close attention to the location of this body, it's almost in the middle of the island, right south of Leeds, north of Sheffield, just uh, east of Manchester, Zygmunt Adamski. This is Zygmunt. Very famous case. Very famous case in Missing 411 Law. Disappeared June 6, 1980 at about 3.30 p.m. He's a Polish native. At about 3.30, he says goodbye to his wife who had multiple sclerosis. Don't know if it's important or not, but she did. And he's walking to the store. And he's walking from his house in Tingley to his house in Wakefield. The following day, he was going to a wedding of his goddaughter, something that everybody said there's no way he would miss. But he disappears, he doesn't come back. And everyone says this is completely out of character. Zygmunt would never do this. Well, five days later, and about 20 miles away in a town called Todd Morden, uh, a man named Trevor Parker is working at his coal yard. And he was there on the coal yard from 8 to 11 in the morning, he comes back at 3.30, and he knows, notices on top of a 12-foot pile of coal is Zygmunt. He didn't know Zygmunt, but there was a body up there. And the coal was stacked, kind of like a pyramid, I guess. And there was no track marks going up, no track marks going down, but he noticed that this guy's dead, calls the police. A police officer named Officer Alan Godfrey responds. Alan was and is a sharp guy. Every once in a while, you know, you get a dim light responding, but not this time. And the first thing Alan notices is, yeah, there's no track marks going up, up and down this coal pile. It's completely smooth, like somebody just dumped the coal and put the body on top. And it looked to him like it had been placed there. And right away he noticed that Zygmunt was wearing a coat with no shirt. His pants were put on cockeyed, kind of weird. His shoes were on strange and his socks were on strange. Not normal how a person would put their clothes on. And he also noticed that everything in the body 
was really clean. Really clean. And there were some burn marks with a gel substance on it around the neck and the shoulders. So the body goes to autopsy. And Dr. Edward does the pathology and the autopsy that night. And he put the, the time of death and the date of the death, June, June 11th, disappeared June 6th, June 11th between 11 and 1, the day he was found. Problem, he had one day growth of beard that he'd been missing for five days. And the clothes were clean, so he hadn't been out in the elements for five days. Very strange. No tracks. He was a minor. His eyes were wide open when he was found. But the clothes being clean, I've written about this before on these bodies. And they're really clean. So was he cleansed in some way? So they ruled the cause of death was heart attack which is strange. And the, the real problem with this case is why was it the body placed there? There's a lot of place to put a body. He wasn't attacked. The cause of death wasn't noted for months. And this thing got a lot of attention for the reasons I gave you. But I, the clothes issue, the body being clean, that's what bothers me the most on this one. What was it about Zygmunt? He was a Polish native. He, he was born and raised in Poland and came to the UK. So what happened? Don't know. Talking. I should show you this too because he deserves that admiration. That's Alan Godfrey. Did a good job on this case. And he, uh, he was paying attention where a lot of people wouldn't. Thanks for Alan for doing a good job. Next case, I'm going to Minnesota now. So Minneapolis, Lake Superior. This is the Canadian border, water, water everywhere through here and we're at the Red Lakes Wilderness area just left, north of the Red Lake Reservation. This is Grand Forks, Fargo, Bemidji. So Corey Kelly, 38 years old, October 16th, 2006. Uh, he, he lived in Crookstown, Minnesota. He was baptized in the local Trinity Lutheran Church. He was employed by J.R. Simplot uh, in construction. He had two sons and he loved the outdoors, loved his kids immensely, liked to take him hunting and fishing. On this trip, he was with his friend named Jim Neprud and they were going in to hunt grouse. So as they arrived at the campsite, they started to unload their stuff and Jim realized he needed some gas for the stoves and things. And he said he was going into town. He was gonna leave his uh, dog, a golden lab with Corey when Corey went out hunting for some grouse. So when Jim left, he stated he last saw Corey about 200 yards from the campsite heading out with a shotgun and Jim's dog. And Jim went into town. A couple hours later, Jim comes back, campsite's the way he left it, Corey's gone, dog's gone. And he starts honking his horn, flashing his lights, he does this throughout the night. The next morning, somebody drives by the campsite and Jim asked him to notify the Beltrami County Sheriff's. The sheriffs arrive. Immediately they start a big search, canines, ATVs, dozens of ground teams. But what bothers everybody is that Corey knew this area like you know your backyard. He grew up going to this place. Nobody believed he'd get lost. And he was he had a, enough to get through some real harsh weather. He was dressed appropriately. He had a lighter. Uh, he had a dog. He had a shotgun to blow off some rounds if, if he was lost. So 
On October 28th, uh, about 12 days after Corey disappeared, they're still searching for him, and they find his cigarettes and a lighter. Now, in this wilderness area, to find that, that tells you how comprehensive the search was and how good it was. They were looking hard. On the next day, the 29th, 14 miles from the campsite, the Minnesota Criminal Bureau of Apprehension finds Corey's overalls, socks, hooded sweatshirt. And they're saying, what? So Corey had a lighter. He could make fire if he was cold. Uh, he had a shotgun. He could kill something. He could shoot off rounds to get help. What was going on? They didn't know. On October 30th, winter starts to set in and they got two inches of snow and the sheriff calls off the search. Nothing happens until April 28th, the next year. Sheriff puts his couple of people in a helicopter and they start flying the area looking to see what they could find, looking for Corey. And not far from where they found the pants and just 12 feet off a trail, one of the biggest worn trails, they find a naked body laying in the reeds. And the sheriff couldn't believe what he was seeing. But they go down, they get the body, it's Corey. They take it to autopsy, and they say it was hypothermia. And the coroner states he died the day after he disappeared, or the day of he disappeared. Nobody believed it, <laughs> including me. And the mom made statements that there's no way Corey could have made it 14 miles through that landscape. There's no way anybody could, because it's filled with swamps down timber and there's just no way if mud and oh there's no way so the coroner made an abbreviated statement that he died the first night he disappeared and if you think about it he had the dog cuddle with the dog for heat he had a flashlight he had a lighter to build a fire he's found 15 feet from a walking path he had a cell phone that was never turned on. He was hiking in an area he knew. Shotgun was never found. Uh, when they, they did find the dog, Sammy, two weeks after the disappearance, and they found that the dog was dehydrated. Stop right there. It's a big red light to me. Because there is water everywhere in this area. To say that dog was dehydrated makes no sense at all. You hear that? Now, Corey was an outdoorsman. He knew how to survive. It's the reason he had a light lighter, some cigarettes, a shotgun. He had big coat, clothing. He, he could have survived. If he had hypothermia the first night, if they said he had hypothermia the third or fourth night, eh, maybe. Maybe. The first night, I don't believe it. I don't believe the whole story, and neither did a lot of people associated with this. How did he get 14 miles from point to point? That's number one. Why did he dump his clothes, number two? I think you know what I think. He was placed there by something that we don't understand. They didn't find any tracks around the body, but I understand that. That was six months after he disappeared. So what happened to Corey Kelly? It's a case that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Uh, I was one of the first people to write about it in my book because I saw the problems with this case. And when you see the problems with other cases that I've even read to you today, it should start be making sense. The clothing issue, the weather, the water, lack of clothing, lack of tracks, cause of death. I really want people to pay attention to this. All we, do, all we need is just one of these videos to really take off and then people will start to pay attention and you, they'll start to see a pattern. I know the people that have read the books see the pattern. And again, you can get the books at most of your local libraries. I'm not trying to push them. but. I really wish that people would read. So folks, thanks a million for watching. 
I deeply appreciate your friendship, and I do consider you guys friends. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in the position I am to talk to you about these cases. Um, these missing people are in my heart every day. And I, there's nobody else out there that's pushing this cause and trying to find answers out there. So thank you for watching. Stay tuned. And hopefully I'll see you next week.